My field of research is that of fluorescent spectroscopy. This is the investigation of small objects using light. To demonstrate this, I am going to use five different samples. You can see the five samples under normal room light. So the first sample is water, and water is a very small and stable molecule. It shouldn't interact with light too much. The second sample is a silica suspension of nanoparticles. These small glass nanoparticles shouldn't exhibit any fluorescence, but because they will get an um, beam path, they should scatter light quite highly. And you can see the cloudiness of the solution with respect to water due to the light scattering. The third, fourth, and fifth solutions are fluorescent dyes in water. So I've got fluorescein dye, rhodamine 6 g dye, and a Dota dye. And the chemical structure of rhodamine 6 g is shown to the top right. Most fluorescent dyes are aromatic dyes, which means they have a series of aromatic rings, such as rhodamine 6 g Instead of looking at these samples using standard room light, I'm going to examine them using a laser. I'm going to use a Delta Diode 510 laser, which is manufactured at Hariba Scientific IBH, and I'm going to attach it to one of our simplest filter-based sample chambers. So here are my five samples, and here is the system. So we can see that the laser is on and that it's repping at 100 megahertz. The laser is going through the sample compartment and it's hitting a piece of card at the side of the system. So you can see that the laser is at 510 nanometers, giving this intense green light. And we can see that there's not too much light going to the back of the sample compartment, which is at 90 degrees to the excitation beam. So let's put our water sample into the sample compartment. So let us look at our first sample, which is water. And as you can see, not too much happens. Most of the light doesn't interact with the water at all and just passes straight through hitting the piece of card as before when we didn't have a sample in the sample compartment. You can see some slight scattering in the water, but you need to look close. So let's put in our second sample, which is the Ludox suspension. The Ludox nanoparticles should scatter the light quite highly and have a look at that, that brilliant green beam. So the laser light is simply being scattered as it passes through the Ludox suspension and you get this vivid green beam. It's the same color as the laser light and again, you've got the beam hitting the piece of card to the right and not too much happening at the back. Let's put in our first fluorescence dye, fluorazine. And you'll have to look closely here. You'll see that the green going through the fluorazine is a slightly different shade of green to the laser light. The change in wavelength means that some fluorescence emission is occurring, but this laser isn't very well suited to the fluorescein sample. We'd be better having a blue laser instead of a green laser. So let's put in a sample which is more suited to this green excitation source. And let's put in rhodamine 6G. 
and look at that awesome yellow glow coming from the Rode Main 60. So the Rode Main 60 absorbs the green light from the laser and it later emits this intense yellow light. And a high proportion of the laser beam manages to pass through the sample hitting the piece of card at the back. We can repeat this with the Adota sample and it has again emission in the yellow so we can see the sample is also quite intense. Normally we wouldn't use our eyes as detectors for fluorescent spectroscopy measurements. We would have a more sensitive detector and we would have this at right angles to the sample so we don't blast it with laser light. With really scattering all that happens is the light bounces off the sample and the bigger the object in the sample is and the more of it the more intense the Rayleigh scattering will be. Rayleigh scattering occurs in about a femtosecond so this process can be thought of as almost instantaneous. In the case of the fluorescence you can see that the wavelength has clearly shifted in color and it's went from green to yellow. This means it's lost some energy. This shift in color can be described using a Jablonski diagram. So if we look at the Jablonski diagram in some more detail, we can see that we've got two electronic states. We've got an electronic ground state and an electronic excited state. Now, each electronic state has a series of vibrational levels. At standard conditions, i.e. room temperature, the thermal energy available to the system is relatively low. This means the probability distribution is such that pretty much all the molecules are at their lowest vibrational level of their electronic ground state. If we excite a rhodamine 6 g molecule using our delta diode 510 laser, we can promote an electron from its lowest vibrational level of its ground state to its electronic excited state. And more than likely, it'll be excited to a higher vibrational level of the electronic excited state. Excitation is a relatively instantaneous process occurring in about the femtosecond regime. That's 1 times 10 to the minus 15 seconds. After excitation, any additional vibrational energy is quickly lost to the environment as heat. This takes the system to its lowest vibrational energy of its electronic excited state. This vibrational relaxation results in a slight loss in energy and is the reason why the fluorescence is at a different color to the laser used to excite the sample. So we've used this green laser to excite the sample and we've got this yellow fluorescence. Yellow is higher in wavelength or lower in energy than green. The difference in wavelength is known as the Stoke shift. Vibrational relaxation occurs within a time scale of about a picosecond, that's 1 times 10 to the minus 12 seconds. The excited state of rhodamine 6G is relatively stable, so this molecule may remain in this excited state for a period of time, typically close to a nanosecond.
Eventually, the road made six G molecule will spontaneously emit a photon. The spontaneous emission of photon occurs again almost instantaneously in about a femtosecond. However, as mentioned, rhodamine 6 g may remain in its excited state for quite some time before emitting this photon. So we can pulse the delta diode 510 laser and we can compute the time that we pulsed the laser. And then we can also compute the time it takes for a photon to be emitted and arrive at the detector. As mentioned, however, it's a spontaneous process. So the information from just one single photon on its own isn't very good to characterize a sample. Instead, what we do is we compute the decay times for a series of molecules. And from the series of molecules, we can build up a histogram such as the one shown. The histogram shown was quite a crude one. In most measurements, we would measure to a peak count of at least 10,000 counts. And we would typically have at least 500 bins per fluorescence decay. The fluorescence decay is generally of an exponential form, such as that shown. For convenience, it's often plotted in a log scale because the log of an exponential is a straight line. And we can fit this data to get the fluorescence lifetime. The lifetime is the time it takes for the intensity to fall 1 over E. The fluorescence lifetime is a very sensitive parameter. It may be used to detect changes in the local chemical environment of the rhodamine 6 g dye in this case. And such measurements are carried out routinely within the life sciences for sensor applications. It's also routinely carried out within the food sciences. You might get a sample and determine its properties, and you might get a bad sample and determine its properties. Then you can get an unknown sample and you can quickly measure whether it's okay or not.